Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining Jennifer Schaus and Associates in our complimentary webinar series for U.S. federal government contractors. We're coming to you live from Washington, D.C. today. This webinar series is running for 15 weeks or on 15 Wednesdays as we cover subcontracting opportunities within each of the federal departments. As usual, all of our webinars are complimentary, so you can find the schedule, registration links, and recordings on our website under the subcontracting section. Our data partner each week is GovSpend, formerly FedMine, and our legal perspective will be covered by a rotating government contracts attorney each Wednesday. And a little bit more about us, as you can see on the slide, we provide the following services for federal contractors, including product, service, and software firms across the globe. You can find more information about us on our website. Our webinars and newsletters reach a vast array of federal contractors, and our YouTube channel has now almost 600 complimentary webinars, though we're adding every week. So please follow our channel and give our videos a like or a comment. And we also offer advertising opportunities, including in this series right now. So if your organization is interested in reaching federal contractors, you can sponsor an event, our webinars, advertise in our newsletter, or have us post your promotional information on LinkedIn. You can contact us at hello at jennifershouse.com for pricing and for our media kit. Um, so that email is right there at the bottom. Please note we've added a new procurement playbook webinar on doing business with the NSA. This will be a live webinar only. We're not recording this. Um, the slides will not be available after, so don't miss this rare opportunity to participate. This will be October 21st, that's a Friday um, at 12 p.m., and the government speaker will be taking audience questions during this webinar. So we really hope that you're able to join us. Again, that's Friday, October 21st. All right, and now we'd like to take a quick moment to personally thank the organizations that help make this series possible. A special thanks to Tom Johnson and the team at Set Aside Alert for posting this webinar series in their newsletter. Please visit setasidealert.com to learn about their services for small businesses. Additionally, we'd like to thank GovEvents and also Fairfax County for sharing this webinar series on their public calendars. Please visit their websites and calendars for more and other related events. We'd like to thank the Virginia PTAC. Virginia PTAC is based out of GMU in Fairfax, Virginia, and offers free one-on-one -on -one counseling on federal, state, and local procurement topics. Online resources and group trainings are free with no restriction on your business location. So if you're interested in learning more, please use the links provided to contact the PTAC. And we'd also like to thank our friends at BidSpeed. The BidSpeed platform helps you win and increase your probability of winning government contracts. They have opportunities from every federal, state, and local public source in the United States. So if you're looking for a compliance matrix, a proposal template, a strategic teaming partner, or details on an expiring contract, BidSpeed can help. BidSpeed is an official partner of the SBA's 7J Management and Technical Assistance Program. Contact BidSpeed at the email or phone number here to learn more. And thank you to Gov White Papers, an online resource for content. Gov White Papers is a free knowledge hub for the public sector in supporting industries to find, post, and promote government and military related content. Explore B2G advertising solutions with our team of expert government marketers so you can connect with public sector decision makers. Promotional opportunities include lead generation, display ads, white label content creation, email marketing, and more. Browse thousands of free white papers, ebooks, case studies, and more to stay informed on topics like energy, defense, economy, healthcare, technology, and education. Plus, upload your content for free to boost website traffic and exposure in the government community. Join Gov White Papers today to get started. And lastly, we'd like to thank KME Digital. Sales and growth for government contractors is difficult with increasing competition every day. KME Digital helps federal contractors improve their online visibility and create successful advertising campaigns to reach buyers and prime contractors. 
Leveraging KME services will add muscle to your capture strategies, as well as increase your company's PWIN and help identify teaming opportunities that result in federal contracts. Win more federal business this fiscal year and gain an edge online by working with KME Digital. Contact them at 703-585-3321. All right, and so today we're here to dig into subcontracting opportunities at the Department of Education. So let's just take a quick look at our agenda. Um, as you can see, we're going to start with our panelist introductions. And we'll close out today with legal insights. So our first panelist today is Ms. Archisa Meehan, representing GovSpend. GovSpend is the go-to resource for finding federal contracting opportunities. Please contact Archisa for more information about the GovSpend platform. Thank you for being with us today. Nice to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And our legal speaker is Brandon Dobbins, and he's from Taft Law. Brandon, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. All right. So we're going to kick this off quickly by looking at the mission statement from the Department of Education. And the mission of the Department of Education is to promote student achievement and preparation for global competitiveness by fostering educational excellence and ensuring equal access. It's always important to look at this um, before we even start um, delving into you know, the contracting trends of the department because the mission statement is really um, at the heart of that. So next, um, I'd like to draw your attention uh, to the various agencies and services within the department. Um, we encourage you to spend more time on each of these websites and, and learn more about each specific role um, and specific mission. And then here's quickly some links, um, the link to the main department website, as well as the small business office, um, and then as well as their procurement forecast, the procurement forecast, can help you understand what the department is buying, when they're buying it, how much, and if any specific set-aside or contract vehicle may be used. And then lastly, um, we have the SBA scorecard there, which can help you understand the small business contracting trends and what dollars are being won by women, veterans, hub zone firms, and other disadvantaged businesses. All right, and so with that, uh, let's just take a quick look at the top 10 vendors for this department. I won't read these off to you because in a second uh, we're going to go through the top uh, five vendors in a little bit more detail, um, but just make a note of these. And now I'm going to pass it off to Archisa to go through the top five. Perfect. So um, thank you so much. Um, so really nice uh, to be part of this subcontracting series. And for those who don't know me, um, my name is Archisha Meehan, and I'm the director of federal go-to-market at GovSpend and FedMine. Um, so before we sort of go into the company profiles and things of that nature, I always like to talk a little bit about the data. Um, we are focused on subcontracting data. So keep in mind that the prime contract data comes from FPDS, which is truly the authoritative source for any federal contract data. The subcontract data that we get and we show in these slides is coming from USA Spending, which really gets its information or its subcontract data from FSRS. Now, this information is self-reported by the prime or sometimes the subs, um, you know, so I always want to make sure I mention that. Um, Typically, when the SBA is looking at its goaling or the agencies are looking to see how, uh, you know, a prime has done in terms of its subcontract reporting, it's going to look at another data source called ESRS. Unfortunately, that data set is not made public. So when I'm going through the information, I'm looking at the subcontract data that is made public via USA spending. Um, also, I always want to sort of say, you know, why is the subcontract data info, uh, important? Um, so as a small business, we're really trying to understand not only who the top primes are within an agency, what is the type of work that they're doing. We also want to understand who are the subcontracts that they might be working with on that specific contract or within a specific agency. And also if that prime contract has a subcontract plan requirement. Now, that data, whether a contract 
uh, has a subcontract plan requirement is made public. It is an FPDS. It's part of that transaction detail. So I always like to like to let you know that. Um, so when we're looking at the companies, uh, you know, as a small business, I'm going to say, pay attention, understand who's running contracts, who are the subcontractors that they might be working with, are they a subcontractor, do other primes, and use that information as you start reaching out and having your conversations with these businesses to win awards. Um, so having said that, let, let's go into the top five companies. Uh, within the Department of Education. So the first one is Accenture Federal Services, LLC. Uh, next slide. Um, as you can see, this uh, company, no surprises, has been doing amazingly well, uh, you know, with within uh, almost, uh, oh, oh, sorry, here's the link. Thank you, Madeline. <laughs> has been doing amazingly well uh, with regards to its, uh, prime contracts that it has received um, this year sorry fy22 it's it has received more about 2.5 billion dollars this number will increase as all the contracts from all the defense agencies which have a 90-day delay get made public so i won't be surprised if um, you know, we will see uh, fy22 being really really good for Accenture federal um, as you can see within the Department of Education, um, you know, they were at $252 million in FY20, went up to $281 million, and last year it was at about $279 million. Um, next slide. Um, in, in, in the type of work that they're doing at the Department of Education, uh, they're really working on um, uh, reporting and disbursement of the Title IV federal student program, um, including the direct loans and Pell grants and teacher education assistance. Um, it's also interesting to note that, you know, you can see right at the bottom that the subcontract plan is required. And on this specific contract, they've actually listed the subcontractors that they're working with. Um, so it's always easy to then get in and understand what each subcontractor is doing and if it is something that you could do better, uh, but it gives you that visibility and transparency. So as you're focusing on creating a relationship with Accenture, you know exactly the companies that they might be working with. Um, let's go to the next slide. So for the last fiscal year, uh, you know, Accenture's worked with about 48 uh subcontractors um yeah 48 uh sorry 46 subcontractors and they've given work of close to 20 million dollars to them with censure blue rose consulting smooth stack dlt solutions innovative objects uh being the largest sub awardees and as you can see most of the subcontracts that they've awarded is in the 541 512 next code so always wanted to make sure I show you that. Um, next slide. So now we can go to the second company within um, education, which is uh, the Higher Education Assistance Agency at, in Pennsylvania. Um, it is the pair, It is part of the state of Pennsylvania. As you can see, it's an org website. Uh, so next slide. Uh, here is a link for uh, registering with uh, and uh, as a small business vendor or doing business with the specific um, company or organization. Uh, and then in terms of contracts, this company is really focused just in education at the Department of Education. Um, FY21 was definitely a big year for them with more than $220 million in contracts. Uh, FY22 was definitely much less at 112 million. Um, and then as you can see, uh, this uh, contract that they have also has, um, has a requirement for uh, subcontract information. Um, so next slide. The third organization uh, that we're going to talk about uh, is Great Lakes Education Loan Services. 
So again, keep in mind uh, with the mission of an agency, which sort of is going to, uh, you know, the, the top companies will definitely be in line with the mission of the agency. So you see a lot of loan servicing type of companies that have the large contracts within Department of Education. And again, no surprises there. What's really good to know is that most of these contracts do have a subcontract plan requirement. So let's go to the next one. Um, here is the link to register as a small business with the Great Lakes Educational Loan Services. Um, and then again, um, no surprises, the Department of Education is their primary and only client. Um, FY22 has definitely seen a dip in the contracts that the company has received. And again, they are providing direct loan services such as call center and financial reporting. Um, you know, and of course, this contract has been extended, so it's yet yeah, the same contract that's been winning them money or task orders. Um, next slide. The fourth one is a Naviant. Again, next slide. We will give you the link to register uh, as a small business vendor with Naviant. Uh, next slide. Uh, and here you can see that um, they actually they've not had much uh, activity in in the last year uh, FY22 but in FY21 they definitely were one of our largest uh, uh, companies and um, just so that you know we you know since we did these slides before the end of fiscal year 2022 uh, when we looked at the top five companies uh, or the top 10 companies we were basing it off fiscal year 21 just clarification um, next slide. And then right here, you could see that Naviant also has a subcontract plan requirement. Again, it is for call center and financial reporting. Um, and it's interesting, most of the contracting specialist and contracting office information is the same individual. So, um, yeah. Uh, next slide. And I think the last company that we're going to touch on today is uh, Nelnet Servicing LLC. Um, next slide. Uh, here is the link to register or gives you more information about the company. Uh, and next slide, you can see um, that in FY21, they were at $145 million. FY22 definitely has been a great year for them with $240 million in contracts um, and task orders. And it's really to provide direct loan services. Um, call center and financial reporting services. And again, there is a subcontract plan requirement. Um, so again, when I've not shown any subcontract information for any of these companies, it's just because it's not reported with an FSRS, uh, just so that we, you know, to clarify that. Um, and I think that brings me to the end of my slides and back to you, Madeline. Thank you so much, Archisa, as always. Um, thank you for all of your data and your great insights. So now um, we're going to go through some marketing best practices really quick. Um, we've listed the basics for marketing your services to the top primes here. Most importantly, you should use the tools available on SAM.gov or the GovSpend platform to conduct research on the primes and expiring contracts. Use the Prime's website, their newsletter and events calendars, as well as their social media. Um, definitely just try to learn as much as you can about them um, before connecting. It's really important to do that background research. Lastly, set yourself apart and lead with your capabilities, not your socioeconomic status. Bring a specific opportunity to the Prime um, and work with the SBLOs the small business liaison officers, they're your advocates. Um, so we did just put all of those links um, to contact for the top five companies. So just keep that in mind. Um, and I did want to note that um, we've covered the federal acquisition regulations on the Department of Education earlier this year. Um, so you can find the YouTube recording um, here on the screen uh, as we go through some legal considerations. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Brandon. Brandon, the floor is all yours. Just let me know when you're ready for your next slide. Sure, and thank you. Um, and you can advance the slide, please. Um, 
So uh, a lot of this, uh, what I'm going to cover here today, was covered in the earlier presentation as well, but we just wanted to get some, some uh, focus on the subcontracting elements uh, as part of the, uh, the EDR supplement, uh, the DEER sub, the, the EDR supplement that um, for uh, the Department of Education specific FAR uh, flow down clauses. So um, <clears throat> starting out with uh, best practices, uh, number one, and most importantly, um, check out Ed's deviations uh, to the FAR and EDR, um, which are published uh, at their uh, website. They have issued um, several. There's currently six deviations um, relating from everything to key personnel notifications to uh, several significant cybersecurity requirements um, that would be implemented in any contract and most likely flowed down as part of your performance uh, under any prime contract as a subcontractor. Next slide, please. Um, next, uh, note that if, if there's a contracting officer uh, who communicates to a prime that there is a commitment of, that a contract modification or order is awarded, um, this can be ratified post hoc. It doesn't have to necessarily go through a normal procurement process. Um, there is a process in the EDR where the contracting officer making that commitment requests approval from their managing office. Uh, the chief of contracting office can ratify or reject those commitments up to 25,000 and any other commitments have to be ratified or rejected by the head of contracting office in the Department of Education. Uh, next slide please. Um, the Department of Education has some interesting flexibility in their contracting. Um, in addition to the normal contract types that you would see in any other agency, cost reimbursement, time and material, labor hours, et cetera, um, the Department of Ed can also engage in a couple different types of contracts, such as cost sharing contracts, um, where the prime or, you know, and the prime may require the, the, the sub to, um, to cost share as well, but these are normally um, in the uh, public education space uh, in, in terms of doing research. Um, but these contracts where um, costs would be advanced by the, both the government and the contractor, um, where performance is partially paid by each uh, entity. So if there is a cost sharing contract, the costs under these contracts can't be reimbursed by any other type of federal contract, grant, or cooperative agreement. Um, so just make sure that if you are involved in a cost sharing contract and the prime requires you as a subcontractor to share in that cost, um, you cannot fund that with other federal dollars. Um, Department of Ed also offers incentive award contracts. Uh, this is uh, most often in the debt collection and um, servicing types of contracts where there's a performance-based uh, compensation to the contract um, and the government wants uh, performance as a measure for getting extra money on the contract. Um, these have to be justified specially by the contracting officer and approved by the head of contracting office. Next slide, please. Um, there are different reporting obligations uh, for conflicts of interest and violations of several different uh, legal requirements that require special reporting periods and, uh, and an obligation to, to notify contracting officers. Um, just if you're in a subcontract relationship, you need to, to make uh, pay special attention to whether any of these clauses are specifically flowed down to you, um, noting the different reporting requirements. Uh, probably this is going to be a prime requirement to notify the prime so they can notify the Department of Ed, but just make sure um, you, you pay attention to these special uh, clauses for for, CO, for OCIs, uh, the FARS gratuities clause, any antitrust laws, uh, violation of the covenant against contingent fees, or uh, restriction on contracts with government employees, meaning that <clears throat> the government employee cannot receive a contract with the government. Uh, next slide, please. Um, in, in conjunction with that, there are also ed specific reporting deadlines. Um, and I've listed a couple examples here 
Uh, if there's a legal action arising out of the performance of your contract, you have to immediately notify your contracting officer. Um, and if there's a debarment or suspension proceeding brought against you, you have to notify your contracting officer within 30 days. Um, so just make sure you'll note any deadlines. And normally as a subcontractor, these would be advanced. So if the, if the thing says 30 days and I'm the prime, I put 15 days in your subcontract. So I have time to notify the government. Uh, so just pay attention to those deadlines. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So next, we're going to talk about a couple specific required flowdown contract uh, flowdown clauses that are in the EDR as something that ha is mandatory to be flowed down to subcontracts. Uh, the first one is certification at or below the simplified acquisition threshold. Uh, you have to warrant, to the best of your knowledge and belief, that no organizational conflict of interest exists, or that they've all been disclosed. Um, and if a, one arises during performance you have to notify the government as soon as it's discovered and include a mitigation plan to combat that OCI. Uh, next slide, please. So the next clause, again, related to that conflict of interest, um, the, uh, this clause actually contains a specific language required in the certification. So if you identify an OCI and are required to report it, uh, under the previous clause uh, at our 3452209-70 contains the specific information that's required to be contained in your certification. Uh, next clause, or next slide, please. Um, again, related to the conflict of interest, um, <clears throat> this is uh, again pointing out mitigation plans and making sure you notify as soon as it's discovered. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so if you're performing research uh, involving human sus uh, subjects, uh, you know, be it social science researches, medical, et cetera, under a, a contract fit, uh, funded by the, the Department of Education, um, the Prime and all of its subcontractors have to comply with department regulation on the protection of human research subjects. Um, this includes uh, applying for, if required by the contracting officer, uh, federal wide assurance from the Office of Human Research Protections from the Department of Health and Human Services, um, filing a institutional review board, uh, review and approval of the, the research, um, and any other uh, requirements that the, the contracting officer would, would implement. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so there, you'll notice that there are redundant uh, the clauses in here that are required flow down. So the one is the notice clause, which was the previous slide, and then this is the actual clause about research involving human subjects. Um, same same um, things apply when you're talking about human subjects and just. If you're in this space, you'll be familiar with the IRBs and the other requirements. Um, just note that there are special clauses that are flowed down into all subcontracts that require that information. Next slide, please. So <clears throat> the department security requirements here, we're talking uh, primarily about information security um, and other you know, physical security aspects uh, with regard to your place of performance. Um, Again, these are mandatory flow downs, meaning that if you have a contract funded by Department of Education, these security requirements um, are going to be uh, Im implemented. And those are all available at the link uh, suggested there at the Department of Ed's website. These also require uh, personnel security screenings, um, which are required to be conducted within a certain time period after hiring. Um, and for any person that's moved on to the contract. Uh, and you also have to come up with a security uh, position risk categorization of all your employees. So there's high, medium, low. You have to assign a risk level to each position and notify the, the government of those categorizations and what the policies are for those uh, risk levels under the security uh, package. Next slide, please. Again, this is the previous slide was the notice requirement. This is the actual implementation. Um, 
same same uh, requirements apply. Next slide, please. So here is a non-mandatory flow down. This is a um, permissive flow down that it will probably be flowed down by most prime contractors since it applies to them and they are going to make sure that they're getting the information they need to complete their uh, requirements. Uh, this applies to all contracts, not with the Federal Student Aid Division of the Department of Ed. Um, so if you're talking to FSA, you know, meaning you're in one of those servicer contracts, this is this doesn't apply. But any other division of the Department of Ed, it does. Um, so if any person is going to be paid as a consultant, um, the prior written approval of the contracting officer may be required um, if they're going to be a consultant rather than so just note this clause, and if it's flowed down, make sure you're you're following it. Next slide, please. Uh, so finally, uh, we're going to talk about some some other considerations, uh, just kind of high level. What else do we need to be looking at when we're talking about Department of Education contracts? Um, the good thing is, is unlike the FAR and unlike the DFARS, uh, EDR is pretty short. You you can read through it in an afternoon uh, and get a get a pretty good idea of what requirements would apply. And it applies to all ed contracts unless the contracting officer expressly excluded some provisions when they were bidding the contract. And there may be reasons that they've done that and those would be justified and, and backed up and approved by the, <clears throat> the higher contracting levels. But uh, you know, the, 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 the watchword is they're gonna apply. Um, also, you need to note the difference between the contracting authorities for federal student aid and the rest of that. Uh, FSA has its own structure and kind of operates independently of the rest of the department. Um, and they are uh, different points of contact to do be considerate of when you are interacting with FSA. Um, and then finally, uh, most of these requirements are going to be very contract specific. You know, for example, the, the human research items are not going to apply if you're making uh, widgets for some for some ed project. Um, you know, the, the things for FSA won't apply if you're not dealing with student aid. Um, so make sure you're paying attention to the items in your contract, whether or not they apply, thresholds, those types of things. Um, next slide, please. And I, I think that's it for me. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Brandon. Um, if you have any questions for Brandon or Archisa from today's presentation, you can contact them. Um, there's their emails down below. Um, the recording from today's webinar will be available on our YouTube channel as well as on our website within the next 24 hours. And um, we'll also be sending out the slides. The slides um, from this webinar as well as our past webinars in this series are always available on slideshare.net. So thank you everyone for attending today. Um, we look forward to seeing you next week and have a great rest of your day.